tonight. The um, tonight's presentation uh, will be on the Gospel of John, uh, part one. The next week will be the Gospel of John, part two. So tonight I'm going to look at um, basically the, the Gospel of John as 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 a document, um, and I'm we're going to just very briefly look at everything uh, within the Gospel except the theological teaching that we will leave for next week. Okay. So tonight is just an introduction, a critical introduction to the gospel, um, what it is, uh, all the details surrounding it. And next week, we'll, be, um, we'll cover some basic theological teachings that are found, that are unique to John compared to the other gospels. So as one author uh, put, uh, wrote, he said, the best comes last. The fourth gospel is the gospel of gospels the Holy of Holies in the New Testament. And he, he's definitely correct in saying that the, that the fourth gospel is certainly unique compared to uh, the synoptic gospels, the other three. So the study outline of tonight is just a basic prolegomena of just a general introduction. Then part one will be hmm? preliminary. Hmm? You didn't join? All of it's okay. I can continue. Sorry, Mike. Sorry, sorry. Go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. So there's the prolegomena. Part one is preliminary considerations, where we will look at the authorship, questions about the place, the date, the occasion, the purpose, and the audience of the gospel, um, the general outline of the gospel. And then finally, uh, a little, a brief comparison between John and the synoptics. So let's, let's begin. First, the term gospel, as uh, many of you already know, comes from, um, is from the Greek word uh, euangelion, which means good news. The EU prefix means good, and the word angelion is a message. Our English word angel comes from this meaning a messenger. Uh, and in, but in the New Testament, it's also, uh, it's the, uh, the angels are messengers that bring a message. So, uh, and of course this comes from the old English. So uh, the euangelion is the good news. So this is uh, the gospel in Mark chapter one. It says that it reads the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God. So here the word gospel refers to both the good news, that is the message, as well as the written work, meaning Mark's written gospel. Uh, now, John's gospel is an extraordinary gospel. It stands out in a unique fashion compared to the synoptics in its vocabulary, style, and narrative. The vocabulary, John has a more limited vocabulary than the other three Gospels. Uh, the style, John's Gospel is easily understood even by young believers, despite the profound uh, theological truths that are contained therein, it is very easy to understand. Uh, and third, the narrative, John omits much material that is found in the other Gospels, and he pro also provides stories about the ministry of Jesus that are not found elsewhere. So in this sense, in these three points, this is what makes John so unique compared to the others. Now, who was John? If we just answer some basic uh, uh, biographical questions, John was a son of Zebedee and Salome, and he was also the brother of James. Uh, now this James was martyred within the first few years of the early church after the resurrection and all of that, as, and his, his martyrdom is recorded in Acts chapter 12. He was an apostle. He was a fisherman by trade, as was his brother. In Mark chapter one, it reads, when he had gone a little farther from there, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, 
who were also in the boat mending their nets. Now, maybe James is mentioned first because he was the older brother. That's a possibility. But he's mentioned. So we have James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother both mending their nets. So he was a fisherman by trade. Also, quite a number of interpreters believe that John was a cousin of Jesus because uh, his mother was the sister of Mary. That is, Salome was the sister of Mary. In John 19, 25, the text reads, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister. So that's two. Mary, the wife of Clopas, that's three. And Mary Magdalene, that's four. So the, at least these four women are identified at the cross. So Mary, which is Jesus' mother. Salome, which is the mother of James and John. Mary, the mother of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. So by reading the, the John 19.25, many, uh, many interpreters come to the conclusion that uh, these were sisters, ergo John was a cousin of, of Jesus. Now, when John was uh, with the Lord, he was part of the inner circle of apostles alongside his brother James and Peter. Uh, for example, it was only John, James, and Peter alone who witnessed the transfiguration and the passion in the, in the, the Garden of Gethsemane. For example, in Matthew 17, 1, it says, now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves for the transfiguration. Now, you know, the, the, we look at this and we go, well, why did he choose only these three out of the 12 apostles if the 12 apostles were always with him? Uh, in Matthew 26, uh, it reads, and he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. So now he's in the garden. So again, notice he takes Peter and James and John. So it would appear that even among the group of the 12 apostles, perhaps the Lord was a little bit closer to James, um, uh, John, and Peter, maybe because James and John were, were, were cousins. Uh, and so they, they grew up together. And, and Peter, you know, for being Peter. So it's not a case of I don't think it should be interpreted as favoritism or whatnot, but it's just that perhaps he was simply closer to them because of their history and whatnot than the, than the other apostles. But we see this on several occasions where Peter, James, and John are taken apart from the Lord by the Lord to be with him for a teaching or, or a, a, you know, a sign or whatnot. So he appears to be part of this inner circle of apostles. Uh, furthermore, John may have accompanied Peter in following Jesus to the courtyard during the trial. In John 18.15, it reads, uh, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Now, that disciple was known to the high priest and went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. Many believe that this other disciple was none other than John himself. So when Jesus was now taken at the very beginning of the trial and he's going back and forth between one high priest and, and, and another and whatnot at the, at the very beginning of when he was arrested, jo Peter was there, we know this, but it would appear that John also was there. And since he knew the high priest, he had access to the courtyard uh, or he provided him access to the courtyard to see more closely what was happening. Uh, later on, John followed, it was this John who followed Peter to the empty tomb. Uh, the story is recounted in John 20, and we remember that they, when they heard this, they both ran to the tomb. Uh, and the text says that uh, John ran faster. He got to the tomb, and he looked in, but he didn't go in. But then when Peter arrived, he went in to see, and then John went in after. So he was with Peter to go to the empty tomb. 
Uh, and it also appears that John later on was considered a pillar in the early church. For example, the apostle Paul in Galatians 2, he writes, and when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived that perceived the grace that had been given to me, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. So again, notice the three that are mentioned, James, James and John, the brothers, and Peter. Again, they're, they're, they're set apart from all the rest. So here we have the ministry of John later on that he was considered one of the major figures in the early Jerusalem church. So this is, this is what we believe. Now we're going to look at why we believe these things about who the author is uh, of the gospel. So the question of authorship. If we take a look at the external evidence, all the Greek manuscripts attribute this gospel to John, this fourth gospel to this John who we'll see is identified as the apostle. All the church fathers who speak concerning this author refer to John, uh, the son of Zebedee, as being the author of the fourth gospel. Uh, for example, to, 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 my, to my knowledge, there's no church father who said, uh, that the fourth gospel was written, for example, by Matthew or by Peter or by Andrew or anybody else. It was always one, it was clearly identified or when an author was clearly named, it was, it was John. And thirdly, the New Testament canons list John the apostle as the author. That is the New Testament canons are documents that later on uh, in the second century and onwards, uh, Christian authors were writing and they say, well, these are the books that we consider part of the New Testament, part of the, the, the canon of the New Testament. These are the books that we consider as inspired scripture. And then they list the gospels. And John is always identified as the author of the fourth gospel. So the external evidence, that is of the evidence outside of the gospel, is overwhelming in favor. It was virtually unanimous in stating that it is written by John who was one of the apostles. So to give you an, an example or an illustration, Theophilus, who died in 180 AD, so this is second century, and he was the seventh pastor of the church in Antioch. He wrote, uh, um, he wrote a, a, a treatise against uh, a, a, an individual named uh, Otto Lycus, and he attributed the fourth gospel of John to the son of Zebedee. For example, in chapter two of this writing, he writes, and hence the holy writings teach us and all the spirit bearing inspired men of one of whom John says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, um, showing that at the first God was alone and the word in him. So notice the holy writings, spirit, uh, spirit bearing men and then he identifies one of whom who and now he's going to quote the holy writing and what does he quote john 1 1 or at least the first part of john 1 1 who and the author he clearly identified as john irenaeus who died in 202 a.d was a brilliant apologist who wrote a huge book against uh, heretics he often used the gospel of john to refute the Gnostics, uh, the uh, second century heretics uh, as known as the Gnostics. Now Irenaeus claimed that Polycarp as his source, the church father Polycarp, Polycarp was himself a, a, a disciple of the apostle John. So Irenaeus in his major work against heresies in the third book, uh, the first section, uh, or the first chapter, the second section, he writes as follows. John, the disciple of the Lord, who leaned back on his breast, published the gospel while he was resident at Asia, at Ephesus in Asia. So he identifies John, the disciple of the Lord, and then it goes even more specific, who leaned on his breast. And this, of course, is a reference to the Last Supper. He writes, published the gospel while he was living in Ephesus. And Clement, of, and we'll come back to this in a few moments. Uh, another church father, Clement of Alexandria, 
who died in 217 AD, he writes, John, the last of all, composed a spiritual gospel. So we see that already from the second century, the church fathers were, were, were claiming that the fourth gospel was written by John, specifically this John the Apostle. So there was no doubt as to who the author was all the way back from the second century. Now, if we go into the internal evidence and we actually look at the gospel itself, are there clues that, uh, that are in the gospel that will help us determine who wrote the gospel? Well, interestingly enough, excuse me, interestingly enough, this is the only gospel of the four that we can actually do by process of elimination that we can make a very, very, very good case that it's John the Apostle. So let's begin. In John chapter 1, it, uh, it's written, And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So who are the us and the we? When it says the word dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. So he's identifying himself as us and we. These are personal pronouns, plural. So we, he dwelt among us. That means he dwelt with us. And we wow. beheld his glory. We were eyewitnesses to his glory. So he's now starting to identify himself as one of the disciples that was there. Not like Paul later on who only had visions. But he was there. In John chapter 2, it's written, this beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So his disciples were there because the, they saw the beginning of the signs and the manifestation of his glory. And when the disciples saw this, this was the beginning of their faith in him, the beginning of their belief in him. So his disciples refers to who? follower, an apostle, and if so, which disciple? In John chapter 13, it says, then the disciples looked at one another, perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter, therefore, motioned to him, to ask who it was of whom he spoke. And then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? So here we have an interchange between Simon Peter and one of the disciples whom, um, who was leaning on Jesus' bosom. So the disciple whom Jesus loved, who was leaning on his bosom, was one of the 12 apostles present at the Last Supper. Okay, the, 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 we, we, you cannot go wrong because they're there. It's only Jesus and the 12 apostles. Now he's in a home, he's in the upper room of the home. And so the master of the home obviously must have, probably was there. There were servants, they were serving the food and all that. So there was people, no doubt. But the, the intimacy of that last supper was only between Jesus and his 12 apostles. And so this disciple was there now remember that because we'll get back to it in john chapter 21 um the disciples go fishing so now we have a post-resurrection appearance of jesus so the key verses are the following verse one after these things jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the sea of tiberius and in this way he showed himself Verse 2, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathanael of Cana of Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. Therefore, verse 7, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Verse 20, then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following 
who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is it? Who is the one who betrays you? Verse 21, Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. Now, there are seven disciples that are present. There's Peter, Thomas, Didymus, also called the twin, Nathanael, who in the synoptics in the other gospels, it might be the one who's referred to as uh, Bartholomew. Um, four and five, there's the sons of Zebedee, which is James and John, and six and seven, two others. So there are seven disciples that are in the boat with Peter when he says, I'm going fishing. And then they see the Lord on the shore. Let me go back. Oops, one more. So one of them, of those seven, is the disciple whom Jesus loved. And the text itself says, this is the one that was at the Last Supper, who said, Lord, who is it that betrayed you? So the author is identifying this disciple. The disciple that was there is now the one who's in the boat fishing with Peter. Okay? So if there is one thing that we learn about the, the author of the gospel is that he never names himself. He always refers to himself as, as, as the son of Zebedee or the brother of James or the disciple that Jesus loved. So by process of elimination, who could it be since in the previous verse, in verse 21, he now identifies himself as the author. Hold on, let me just move this. See, it says, this is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. So he's now identifying himself. The one who was at the Last Supper, who was there from the beginning at the Last Supper, and he's now in the boat. He now identifies as I'm the author. He says, I, I testified to these things and I wrote these things. So it has to be one of the seven that was in the boat. So who can it be? Well, we can eliminate Peter because Peter is named by name. John never mentions himself, never refers to himself as John. He never identifies himself. He remains anonymous. So Peter is named, so it can't be him. Also, the gospel of Mark is associated with Peter, since th th the church tradition is that Mark wrote the gospel because of his ministry with Peter. Secondly, it can be Thomas because he's named. Okay, just a second. Sorry, he can be Thomas because he's named. Third, it can be Nathaniel because he's named. Fourth, it's got to be, it could be one of the two sons of Zebedee, but it can't be James because James was martyred around AD uh, 42, okay? So it's too early within the very beginning of the church, the church history for him to be the author of the gospel. And as something, a point that we're going to return is that in John 21, 23, it says there was a rumor that the disciple would remain until Jesus returns. Now, if the rumor spread within the church that the disciple would, wouldn't die, that means it takes time for rumors to spread. It means it, 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 went, it, it took time for this thing to grow, and then it got passed on, passed on, passed on. So it took a certain amount of time for these rumors to spread before the, the gospel finally says, no, he never said he would never die. It only says he would still be alive until later on. So James can't be the author because he's martyred. It could be John because he's a close associate of Peter and he's part of the inner circle. But there's the two others. Remember, there's two other disciples that are unnamed. So who are the apostles? Could it be? Well, we have Andrew. Peter's brother, we have Matthew, but Matthew already has his own gospel. There's Simon the Zealot, 
as an apostle, but Simon the Zealot is an obscure figure. Uh, we really don't know all that much about him as an apostle, and he's never ever been proposed as the author of the gospel in subsequent church history. There's James, the son of Alphaeus, again, another obscure figure, and he's never been proposed as the author. And there remains Judas Iscariot, who committed suicide, and there's no way that he could be the author. So it is unlikely that the gospel was composed by a virtual unknown in the early church, for example, such as Simon the Zealot or James. So the last one remaining is really, uh, and also Peter. Peter, is, he was the brother, but he, was, he remained unknown, uh, virtually unknown, and nobody has ever mentioned, no church father has ever um, uh, presented a church tradition that says that Andrew was the author of the fourth gospel. So the only one remaining is the Apostle John. Uh, so this is why by this process of elimination, a good case can be made that John is that beloved disciple who was with Jesus from the very beginning and now at the very end is the, the author of the gospel. And then later on, when we come, if we were to take the time, if ever I do a study on the apocalypse, I'll do this. If you compare the vocabulary of the apocalypse with the vocabulary of John, there are tremendous, there are many, many similarities in the vocabulary. And in the book of Revelation, he identifies himself as John. So that's a further argument to say that it's the apostle who is the author. Now, the author of this of the gospel has a good knowledge of the apostolic group. For example, in 217, it says, then his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house has eaten me up. And that's curious. That means it must have been somebody who was there that was conscious of the fact that the disciples were now remembering of, of an event. How would I know, for example, that Roger went to a store and then all of a sudden he remembered that he forgot something? How could I possibly know that? unless I was there with Roger. And then Roger said, hey, now I remember, and I'm a witness to that. So the author was a witness to what the disciples were, were, were going through at this moment. In chapter four, it's written, and at this point his disciples came and they marveled that he talked with a woman, yet no one said, what do you see? Or why are you talking to her? Uh, again, it's, it's a, a type of little detail that uh, detail in the narrative that paints a historical picture, but as if you're actually there, you know, none of the disciples asked, you know, what are you doing? But how would he know this unless he was actually there and he witnessed this? Uh, in chapter 16, then some of his disciples said among themselves, what is this that he says to us, a little while and you will not see me, and again a little while and you will see me. Again, the, the disciples in the upper room are having a conversation. This is the Last Supper. They're having a conversation amongst themselves. How would the author of the gospel know what they were saying unless he was there and he himself was part of this uh, conversation? Um, and finally, in chapter 21, verses 3 and 7, uh, the text reads, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we are going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Verse 7, therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. Again, uh, narrative, the descriptive detail of having Peter put on his coat and then he jumped in the water. How would John know this uh, unless he was actually there? Uh, it reminds of a detail in the Gospel of Mark, I believe it is, where it says, and the stilling of the storm, where it says Jesus was on the boat uh, and he was below and he was sleeping. His head was on a cushion. 
Why would you mention something like that? His head was on a cushion. You know, okay, well, big deal. But it's, it's an interesting detail. How would you know that his head was on a cushion unless you were actually there or you went down and you saw him? Mark didn't see this, wasn't a witness to this, but Peter was. And Peter is most likely the source of the Gospel of Mark. So here Mark is recording the testimony of Peter, the eyewitness that saw these things. So all of these little details give the impression that the author has a very good knowledge of what was happening, what were the dynamics that were happening among the disciples during their ministry following Jesus. Uh, the author lived in Palestine. For example, he betrays a topographical knowledge of the land of Palestine. He talks about the Sea of Galilee. He mentions that he knows that there's two cities of Cana. Um, for example, he describes the Cana of Cana of Galilee to distinguish it from the Cana of Asher uh, that was in the region of Tyre, going all the way back to the time of, of Joshua. Uh, he, he knows the distance between Jerusalem and Bethany. Chapter 11, he writes, now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. So these are topographical details that he knows. Uh, he refers to one of the gates by name. Now there was in Jerusalem by the sheep gate, a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. So again, this is details. It's a sheep gate uh, and there was a pool. So he knows the name of the gate or the name that was given to the gate. He knows the name of the pool in Hebrew and he knows that it has five porches. Now, why would you mention all this detail or how would you know this detail unless you were actually there and you had an understanding of the area? So we know he lived in Palestine. He was part of the apostolic circle. Uh, and he describes situations and circumstances in detail regarding uh, details regarding the time, the next day, the following day, two days later. These are uh, uh, chronological details that we'll look at later. He mentions places. He mentions numbers that there was 12, there was 13, there was seven, whatnot. And he also mentions what time of day it is. So again, all little details betraying that it is an eyewitness that's recording, that's giving the account. Uh, the author is acquainted with the social and religious conditions of Palestine. In all of these places, there's little details, but in chapter four, to give just one example, or else we'll be here till midnight, uh, it says, then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So you see, he knows this, the, 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 the racial division between the two, and were racial slash religious division between the two. And he mentioned this in the gospel. Uh, he's familiar with Jewish and Samaritan religious belief. Uh, later on in the same chapter, the woman says to him, I know that Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. So here he's giving us a clue to what the Samaritans uh, Samaritan theology is. He's also well acquainted with how the Jewish festivals are celebrated. He talks about the Passover. He gives details about the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Dedication, the Purification Rites. Again, he gives little details of all of this. So he's familiar with these things and how they're celebrated in first century um, in Jerusalem and Israel. So the combined testimony of the preceding list lead to the conclusion that, that the author was an eyewitness to the events. One little detail that we saw in and of itself might not prove that he's an eyewitness, but it, when you have one plus two plus one plus one plus one on and on, it's the accumulation of all of these that make a very strong argument in favor of John being uh, the an eyewitness and the author of the gospel. Now, moving on, the place. Where did John write his gospel? Uh, as mentioned, Irenaeus is the primary source here. And I'll give you two quotations. Uh, 
Irenaeus, the second century church father. Then again, the church in Ephesus, founded by Paul, it's recorded in Acts 19, and having John remaining among them permanently until the time of Trajan is a true witness of the tradition of the apostles. So here Irenaeus is telling us that the very church that was founded first by Paul, now John is there until the times of Trajan, which is very end, close to the end of the, uh, we're getting close to the end of the first century. And later on, Irenaeus writes, on completing his 30th, talking about the Lord now, on completing his 30th year, he suffered, being in fact still a young man who had by no means attained to average age, advanced age, even as the gospel and all the elders testify. Those who were conversant in Asia with John, the disciple of the Lord, affirming that John conveyed to them that information, and he remained among them uh, up to the times of Trajan. Some of them, moreover, saw not only John, but the other apostles as well, and heard the very same account from them, and bear testimony as to the validity of the statement. Who then should we rather believe? So here again, he mentions that John was living in Ephesus until the very close to the end of the first century. So it's most likely at this place, he's far from, uh, from Jerusalem, but it's during this time that he writes, that he composes the fourth gospel. Now, the date. The gospel is of a late date for uh, two reasons, apart from the church history. First, the enemies of the gospel are no longer referred to as the people or the crowd, but now it's just rather the Jews. So given the decades that have passed, Judaism now is becoming much and more adamant against the gospel, the gospel message and Christianity. So John simply refers collectively to the enemies as the, the Jews, the, the, the Judaism that totally rejected the message of the Lord. Um, and it's a late date because as I previously mentioned in John 21, it says, then the saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus not say to him, he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? So um, this implies that a long time had passed from the post-resurrection appearance until the time of John's gospel. So again, to give in years and years and years for the rumor to spread. And then when John finally writes his gospel, he, he, he puts an end to that rumor. So John must have written his gospel prior to 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in Revelation, which was written near the end uh, of Emperor Domitian's reign from 81 to 96. So since Revelation is written, is believed to have been written during this time when Domitian was persecuting the Christians and John was banished, uh, the gospel must have written, must have been published before uh, this time. Okay, so this is why, uh, well, among other reasons, why we believe that Revelation is the last book of the New Testament to be written. Third, the occasion. Now, we cannot discern, sorry, I made a mistake. We cannot discern a specific occasion for John's writing of the gospel. Unlike the gospel of Luke, of Luke which he wrote for Theophilus, as we can see in the, per in the personal dedication. And unlike the letters of Paul, which uh, very often were written to deal with uh, personal issues in the church. So John, there's no occasion in Ephesus that happened that we can discern and go, oh, okay, this happened. So that's why John wrote his gospel. But Irenaeus, again, our famous Irenaeus, he suggested that John wrote his gospel because of the rise of false teaching and heretics that were happening. And first, uh, first John uh, deals with this a lot about heresies and antichrists already. And then Revelation in some of the letters, the Lord mentioned specific uh, false teachings that were, that were creeping into the church. So 
already by the end of the first century, even when the, the apostles were still there, some of them false teachers were arising. So Irenaeus says that Serentius, who was a teacher who argued that Jesus was merely a human who was possessed by the Christ spirit at his baptism and who relinquished the spirit at the cross. And so John responds by stating that the pre-existent word was made flesh. The stress upon the sonship demonstrates that the son was with the father even before the creation. Uh, and if we take a look at 1 John chapter 2, it says, who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is antichrist who denies the father and the son. Whoever denies the son does not have the father either. He who acknowledges the son has the father also. So here, when John is writing 1 John later on, he's starting to deal with these heretical teachings. Okay, about that... Um, it, it, it's, it's not possible that a divine God manifested himself uh, in the flesh. So Serentius was saying that Jesus was simply a normal human, a normal person like you and, and, and uh, you and me. But then at his baptism, when the, the dove came down, now he became possessed with the, the Christ spirit. So now his eyes were opened and he had a new mission in front of him. And then when he was at the cross, uh, this spirit uh, mission accomplished, so the spirit left, you know. Uh, so he, Irenaeus argues that perhaps John is arguing against this in showing that the eternal divine word who existed before the creation now manifested. It. It's the same word who manifests himself in the flesh, and it's the same word who was lifted up, uh, returned to heaven after the resurrection. Now the purpose, the purpose, however, is clearly stated. The occasion might be a little bit debatable, but the purpose of the gospel is very clearly stated because John in chapter 20 writes, and truly did, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So it's, it's a twofold purpose. It's evangelistic and apologetic. Uh, and they're closely intertwined. Jesus' signs demonstrate that he was sent by the Father as the Christ, as the Messiah, in whom there is eternal life. In other words, as the Savior of the world. So the purpose for writing the gospel is right here. So this gives us a, an insight into John's in, into John's reasoning, he wants to demonstrate these two things, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that if you believe this, you will have eternal life in his name. So that's the purpose of the fourth gospel. And finally is the audience. To who is John writing? For example, Matthew, let me show the text. Matthew writes his gospel, we believe, to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem. Okay, this is who he's writing for. So this is why Matthew very often deals with Old Testament uh, prophecies that are fulfilled in the ministry of Jesus. Uh, this is why he often refers to the law. He refers to Moses or the prophets. He's, he wants to demonstrate that Jesus and his ministry is the accomplishment of the Old Testament, the law and the prophets. So he's writing for Jewish believers. Luke, for example, probably is writing, Luke, it will not probably, but Luke is writing for Gentile believers. So he deals with all other issues that, that Jewish believers, that he does, that Matthew doesn't deal with. Um, one of the things, for example, he deals with prayer, uh, uh, not prayer, with, with the women and the importance of women during the ministry, something that Matthew doesn't deal with, but Luke does. Uh, so it's a much more Gentile audience that Luke is aiming for. So here we think that John also wrote for Gentiles. Um, and now why? Well, because number one, Hebrew and Aramaic words are translated into Greek. In other words, they're translated for the non-Hebrew Aramaic speakers. In, the cha in chapter one, it says, 
verse 38 says, then they said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated, teacher, where are you staying? And then verse 41, it reads, he first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. So you see here he's giving you the Hebrew word, but then he translates it into Greek. Why? Well, there is maybe that's a hint that his readers don't know Hebrew or wouldn't know what these Hebrew words mean. So he translates them into Greek, into which they would know. Chapter nine. Then he, and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent, the pool of sent. So here he's giving the, the translation of the, the name of the pool. Chapter 19. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus out and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement, but in Hebrew, Gabbatha. And, and verse 17, and he bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of skull, which is in which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. So here is giving us again the reverse translations from Greek into Hebrew. But the original name was in Hebrew. John is simply reversing it. Chapter 20, Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. So you see, these are examples where he's translating Hebrew and Aramaic words into Greek, presumably because his audience doesn't know these words or don't know what they mean. Um, he provides geographical details for his Gentile readers, uh, which would be superfluous for a Jewish audience. Uh, for example, one author writes, for the writer's habit of, explain, of explaining Jewish usages, translating Jewish names, and locating Palestinian sites, it would seem that he was probably writing for a Gentile church outside of Palestine, which makes sense if we remember he's in Ephesus, you know, two, three decades after the fact. He's writing in Ephesus, so he's giving his Ephesian readers uh, geographical details and linguistic details to help them better understand because they're in Ephesus and they're not in Jerusalem and they're not native um, uh, Jews. See, for example, in chapter five, which I already mentioned, he describes Bethesda as a pool by the sheep gate having five porches. Uh, he describes Solomon's porch as being in the temple. If you're in Jerusalem, you already know this, but if you're in Ephesus, you might not know this. Uh, he describes the Kendra Brook where there was a garden. See, a little detail, but if you're in Jerusalem, you know where the, the, the Kedron Brook is and you know that there's a garden. But if you're in Ephesus, you don't know this. So he's describing, he's giving these little details. And later on, I'm going to get to this appendix of geographical and temporal references. Now, the outline of the gospel, part C, we're almost finished. The outline. So unlike the synoptic gospels, John does not aim at a detailed account covering the whole of Jesus' ministry. Rather, he is highly selective. So according to the purpose of John chapter 20, he selects his material with this particular aim in mind. Now, the church fathers posited some hypotheses on, on, on this. For example, as already mentioned, Irenaeus felt that John, John's motive was writing an anti-heretical gospel. So the polemical aim of John's first letter against the anti-Christian errors may be viewed as a postscript to the gospel. So Irenaeus said, John is starting to write a gospel against these heretics. And first John was like an addendum to the gospel, again, dealing with these heretics, which could be true. But we're, I don't want to say guessing, but it's a conjecture. Clement of Alexandria, that we already talked about, he says he wrote a spiritual gospel as a supplement to the synoptics, which is true, and at the same, it's not true. It's true as a supplement uh, because he gives that much more information that they don't, but there's still so much material that's left out. 
So it, it's a yes and no type of answer. Uh, but all, both of them are true to a certain extent, okay? But they don't cover everything. So the outline of, of John's gospel is, is fairly simple. And most, if you have a study Bible, it'll most likely give you this outline. If you do a commentators, commentators, it'll give you the same thing. There are five major divisions in the gospel of John. There's the prologue, which is John chapter one, verses one to 18. Then there's the public ministry of the word, which is John 1, 19 to 1250. And here it deals with the ministry uh, in Galilee and Jerusalem. We have the seven signs and we have the gradual acceptance by the Gentiles and the progress. Uh, we see the gradual acceptance of the Gentiles and the progressive rejection by the Jews. So that's one to 1250. Then 13, one to 1726, it's the last supper, the last discourse and the last prayer. Verse chapters 18 to, to 20, it's the passion and the resurrection. And finally, 21 is the epilogue. So these are the five major divisions that we find uh, in the gospel. Now, if we took it within these major divisions, if we took a, take a look at the major structural components, there's the seven signs, right? There's the changing of water into wine. There's the cleansing of the temple, the healing of the nobleman's son, the healing at the pool of Bethesda, the feeding of the 5,000, the healing of the blind man, and the raising of Lazarus. By the way, the only miracle, apart from the resurrection, but the only miracle that John shares with the other three gospels is this one right here, the feeding of the 5,000. All these others are not found uh, in all the other three gospels. But this one is found in all four, feeding of the 5,000. And of course, there's the seven I am sayings that are found throughout the gospel. Uh, I am the bread of life, the light of the world. I am the gate, the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, the truth and the life. And I am the true vine, all distinctively uh, joining. Uh, there are numerous witnesses that are called upon throughout the gospel. There's John the Baptist. There's the Samaritan woman who was a witness. Uh, Moses himself at the transfiguration. Or when Jesus says, Moses wrote of me. Uh, the father himself is a witness to Jesus and his ministry. Uh, the Lord himself is a witness. As are not only his teachings, but his works, his miracles testify to who he is. Uh, the spirit and the disciples are also witnesses and the author himself clearly identifies himself as an eyewitness to the ministry of the Lord. Now, finally, John and the synoptics. So whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke share 90% of the material, John shares about 8%. The remaining 92% is unique to this gospel. So if you take a look at the differences between John and the synoptics, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we have the, we talk, they refer to the baptism of John, uh, the temptation by Satan. They refer to parables. There's the teachings regarding the kingdom of God. There's the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is described as son of David, son of man. There's the transfiguration, the exorcisms, and the miracles. And the focus is in the ministry of Galilee. But the Gospel of John is not like this. Rather than the parables, there's long discourses and symbolic language. Uh, the teachings focus on eternal life. Rather than the Sermon on the Mount, we have the farewell discourse as, at this discourse at the very end. Uh, Jesus is described as the Son of God. Rather than all the miracles and the exorcisms, we have only the seven signs. Uh, we have the seven I am sayings, and the ministry focus is primarily in Jerusalem, you know, but he goes back and forth. Uh, Mark, for example, focuses a lot on Galilee, and then only at the very end in Jerusalem. So it's two major sections in the Gospel of Mark. But John, on the other hand, goes back and forth. 
One chapter, he's in Galilee, then he's back in Jerusalem. Galilee, Jerusalem, Galilee, Jerusalem, but the majority of the, the longer chapters and the description is everything that's happening in Jerusalem. Um, explanation for the differences. It, it, the conclusion we reach is that when John is writing his gospel, he presumes that his author, his readers, already know of the other gospels. They already know that there's three other gospels in circulation, and he's presuming that they've already read them and they know what they have. Because the way he writes, um, the way he describes certain events or certain people, it's like he doesn't give all the details. He's assuming that you all, they already know. For example, so um, John 140, it says, one of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. This is John the Baptist, okay? So one of the two who heard John the Baptist speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. But Simon, but this is John chapter one, verse 40. But Simon Peter hasn't been introduced yet. Up to this time, there's no Simon Peter. So who's Andrew? You know, when he writes this, people are supposed to go, was Andrew Simon Peter's brother? And people go, oh yeah, I know Simon Peter, so now I know who Andrew is. But if you don't know who Simon Peter is, you go, was Andrew Simon Peter's brother? And then you go, who's Simon Peter? But you see, John doesn't answer that because he presumes that they already know who he is because he presumes the, they already know the other accounts. Uh, in John chapter three, he writes, for John was not yet cast in prison, but John's arrest is nowhere mentioned in this, in this gospel. Uh, chapter four, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. It's true, he did, but not in the gospel of John. He testified that in the gospel of Matthew, in the gospel of Mark, and the gospel of Luke, but not in the gospel of John. So here he's making a reference to something that the Lord said that he did himself didn't record. It's recorded in the other three Gospels. But he doesn't explain it further because he presumes his, his, his readers already know this tradition. Uh, John 11. Now there was a certain man who was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, of the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Now it was that Mary who had anointed the Lord with mirror and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. But this anointing is nowhere mentioned in the Gospel of John. So again, his readers must already know about this because they already read the other Gospels. Um, another difference between John and the, and, and the other three Gospels is his vocabulary. Of course, we all know this. So particular aspect of John's literary style is the simplicity of style and the limited vocabulary. For example, the word love, in Matthew, it's only found nine times, in Mark 6, in Luke 14, but in John, it's, writ it's written 44 times. This means that John, for John, this is an important term, even though for the other three, it wasn't that important. Truth, the word truth, two, four, four, 46 times. In the Gospel of John, there's a reference to truth. Knowledge. 57 times, uh, I am, Matthew and Luke are pretty high at 14 and 16, but John 54 times. Uh, the word life is found 35 times in the gospel of John, only four times in Mark. The word Jews, five times in Matthew, six in Mark, five in Luke, 67 times in the gospel of John. Uh, the world, 78 times, the witness 47 times, uh, to remain, remain in me, remain in the Father 40 times, and Father 118 times is referred to uh, in the Gospel of John. So by studying the actual, the vocabulary, this gives you an idea of what the author thinks is important as compared to what he might think is not important to his Gospel. 
So all of these vocabulary, all this vocabulary you can see is very important in John comparatively to the other three that for them, they emphasized other words, for example. You know, like in the gospels, uh, hell is, is often mentioned, right? The, the, the condemnation to hell. The word hell is never found in the gospel of John, but it's uh, always judgment or condemnation. You know, this is the synonym that he uses instead. So this is a, 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 the vocabulary difference between uh, John and the synoptics. Uh, we see also, sometimes we see that he groups material together. For example, the ministry of John the Baptist is in Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus departs for Galilee. It's now chapter 4. But John puts all of these things in, in chapter 1. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000. He walks on the water and Peter's confession is found in chapters 14 and then all the way to 16. But in John, he groups all of this in chapter six. So he takes a chunk from that and he puts it in his gospel. But it's very, it, it's all in this one section. And then the, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem is chapter 21. And then the anointing at Bethany is chapter 26. But for John, everything is in chapter 12. And look, he puts this first, and then he transposes this afterwards. So he's not even necessarily following the chronological order that Matthew has. He's, he's presenting something a little bit different. But you see, he groups everything together. With We have to go chapter 21 in Matthew, and then go all the way to chapter 26 as well. So these, again, are demonstrate the differences between John in, uh, and the synoptics in the order of material. Uh, so here again, uh, terminology, um, therefore, this might seem like a small word, right? Uh, you're writing a text, therefore this and this happened, or therefore that. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, it's only found eight times. In John, it's found 138 times. So this is a favorite word for John. So he, he's using this very, very often to, to establish sort of a, a continuation of the thought. A, B, therefore C, you know, very often, 138 times. So we see this all the time. Another word, a favorite word of the mark, for example, is the word and. You, if you take a chapter, you go through it, virtually every verse in, or all easily like 70% of, 80% of all the verses, in a major section, all begin with the word and, and then this happened, and that happened, and, and, and. A favorite word for Mark, it might not be a big theological deal. You go, well, he likes the word and, but it gives you clues as to how the author is composing his gospel and how he's thinking and how he's organizing his material. So um, in the synoptics, Simon Peter, two times, we actually have Simon Peter referred to in this way in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In John, 17 times, he refers to Simon Peter, Simon Peter. Amen, amen, zero times, but in John, 25 times. Uh, to believe in, eight times in the synoptics, but 36 times in John. Again, demonstrating the vocabulary, what John is emphasizing, what he thinks is important, for his purpose in writing his gospel. So even the one word vocabulary becomes important when you study, um, when you study the gospel. So in conclusion, while John clearly knew of the other gospels, he did not use them to any significant extent in writing his own work. His gospel should be viewed as an independent uh, witness to the person and ministry of Jesus of Nazareth. Secondly, the author presents himself as an eyewitness to the events, one who is convinced that the narrative he, he recounts is true and faithful. And third, both the internal and the external evidence lead us to the conclusion that the author is John, one of the 12 apostles, a fisherman, and a son of Zebedee. And that's it.
So thank you all for your patience. Uh, I know there's a lot of material, but you know me by now. So, uh, but, uh, so this covers all the gospel. Like I, like I said, everything about the gospel except the theological issues. Uh, and so next week, um, I'll deal with, with uh, some of the main issues of the Gospel of John, but not going too much in depth because, again, we'll be there for days on end. Okay. So are there any questions? Thank you very much, Mike. It's a lot of information, Mike. Um, yeah. A lot of interested information, but I just want to remind everyone that um, if you want to review your um, this session, they can go on YouTube. Just put in Show Me the Baptist Church and just pick the, the date and they can review it uh, because there's a lot of information uh, in there. Um, so I just want to remind uh, everyone that's... Um, yeah. yeah. Well, look, I, I gave... Uh, I, I know it's it, it might be a bit... I don't want to say it's unfair for you guys, but I did give a... Uh, uh, I did teach a course at the faculty um, on the on the Gospel of John, on the Johannine literature, actually. So all of my notes that I took is that I presented tonight, uh, I, I took from there. You know, I condensed it, I abbreviated, obviously. So okay. uh, you guys are getting an abbreviated uh, university course. So yeah. So I know it's a lot of information, but I, I want to present to you stuff that perhaps you don't often here, you know, but if you have a, a good study Bible or whatnot that have, that has a nice introduction, they'll most likely cover a lot of these details, you know. Okay. So, um, Mike, there's there. I mean, there's many many questions I wanted to ask you, but there's so many. Um, there's one that you you, you mentioned that John. Um, he only tell of, of the, um, he didn't tell the disciple, the other disciple about the, the 5,000. He only told him about the 5,000 hour feet and the other miracle he, he didn't mention. Why was the 5,000 so important that he didn't mention? Um... I, okay. I mean, why, why is the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 the only one who's mentioned in all four? Yes. Why, why was it more important than um, he didn't mention about Lazarus, um, which is uh, for us, well, it was a big um, uh, miracle. So why do you think that he didn't mention, he mentioned the five, only the 5,000 um, that was fed? That's a very good question, Raj. Hmm. I wish I had a good answer. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I mean there was many, there was many things that you, you talked about that was very interesting, but I don't know why yeah. this one just stuck out to me. Yeah. Maybe, well, you see, there's two feedings. I think one of five thousand, one of four thousand, but maybe John chose it because it was such a public. Uh, I mean, five thousand. It was such a public miracle okay. that. Uh, See, the resurrection of Lazarus was much more um, restrained because it was only the members of, uh, of Lazarus' immediate family and some of the Jews who were there. Okay. They saw this, apart with the disciples, obviously. So maybe it was a group of, I don't know, let's say 20, 25 people that actually witnessed this. But the feeding of the 5,000 was such a, a big thing. Uh, uh, I maybe that that's why he chose it. Um, I don't know. There's there's see it's uh, if you if you read if you go through the Old Testament, you um, very often in the prophets and even in the Psalms, uh, God often re when he's when he's arguing against Israel and he's trying to bring them back, he often reminds them. He says, "I'm the Lord your God." I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt, you know, with an outstretched arm and by my hand and my power, I brought you out of Egypt. He all, often, not always, but he often goes back to that because it was a miracle, because it was such an extraordinary miracle, because it was the birth of a nation, 
uh, because it was such a public thing and it was such a grandiose miracle. He often re re reminds them, he says, I'm the one who took you out of slavery because it was such a, a major thing. A out of all the miracles that he did, you know, why does he often refer to that one? Maybe because of that. So why did John deliberately choose this, the, me the, the feeding of the 5,000 to be the only miracle that, are, that all four talk about? Maybe because it was such a, a grandiose miracle, you know, so public, uh, you know, uh, maybe it was that as compared to, you know, a much more private miracle. Okay, I think Theresa um, has a hand up. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer to it, but it also make me made me think of um, like somewhat symbolically in the sense that Jesus fed the so many is the same way that we should be feeding um, in a sense of like feeding the word, the gospel to so many as well. We should take that as an example. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. That, that's just my thought of it, that it should be something that we should be doing as well, not just literally feeding his people, but also sharing the gospel, which is feeding the word. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the word is food for the soul. Uh, I don't know. Delina, you wanted to say something? You're unmuted. No, I was just saying that um, it is also food for the soul. The word, you know. No, yeah. No, that's, yeah. So yeah. that is what Teresa, what Teresa said. It's so true. True, so yeah. Without the, the, the message. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, is there anyone else uh, want to have any comments or anything to ask to pass the mic? Pastor, oh, I didn't realize I was born. I was uh... promoted, graduated. Yeah. <laughs> well, is, is, the information you give there, I'm pretty sure it took a while to study all this information. And it's um, things so you, you know. <clears throat> okay. Uh, speaking of which, I know you. If you can't answer, Raj, don't answer, or Adelina, if you can't answer. But uh, is there any news about uh, any good news, bad news, no news about uh, our pastor search? Um. Well, I don't know if Adelina have any, I mean, uh, um, I think we have like, there is two, two or maybe three application that uh, George just received, but maybe Adelina can uh, um, give us a little bit more information. She's on the committee. Okay. The only thing I can say that we are still, it's very much, we have to speak a lot because um, among us there, you know, we're making decisions and as though it's not ready yet. We don't want to 